Well, good morning again. A special uh, welcome to those of you who are visiting or are new to us. We're so glad you're here this morning. It's, uh, it's been two months since, since Elizabeth and I and the kids have arrived, and we just continue to appreciate your generosity and your welcome to us. And it's been so great to enter into a church that's, that's functioning, because <laughs> Neil was praying. You know, the finances are being looked after. People are getting the church clean. The worship team is meeting every week. Um, it's just been wonderful to be a part of a community that's, that's, uh, that's, that's functioning and well, and, and uh, it's just great to be a part of that. We, uh, when we came two months ago, uh, as the teaching series, we, we started by looking at the Beatitudes, and we introduced the Beatitudes as an invitation into a good and beautiful life. It's an invitation into a good and beautiful life individually, and a life that we can live together um, communally. And if there's one Beatitude that might capture that, it, we could argue that it's today's Beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Um, you might be familiar with the term shalom. It's the Hebrew word for peace. If we understand peace as, uh, as being the absence of conflict, shalom is this much deeper understanding. It's a much richer understanding. Shalom is about wholeness in all of our lives, physically, psychologically, socially, spiritually. It's about our relationships being in order. It's about our relationships being right. And so with that on, in mind, what I'd love to do this morning is a practice that I suppose you haven't done since the days of pre-COVID, is pass the peace. And we'll do it COVID style. So let's take 30, 45 seconds, slip your mask on, we won't shake hands, but turn to someone and say these words, peace be with you, and then in response, and also with you. So let's take a minute and pass the peace. Oh boy, you guys are uh, you guys are good at this. I better uh, I better call you back, and as you uh, get back to your seats, uh, I'm going to invite Dennis to come forward with our scripture reading. Uh, yeah. I think that's a, like a pent up. We haven't done this in so long. We're going to do it. Uh, we're going to do it in really good style. Thank you, Dennis. We're going to do our reading this morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dennis. I'm here with my wife, Arlene. And also, good morning to those who are online by technology. It's, as Pastor Paul said, it's wonderful to see the seats so full today it gives me a great pleasure in my heart welcome i'd like to share with you a reading from the passion translation matthew 5 verses 2 through 12. jesus began to teach them what happiness comes to you when you feel spiritual poverty for yours is the realm of the heaven's kingdom what delight comes to you? Wait upon, wait upon the Lord, for you will find for what you are looking. What blessing comes to you when gentleness lives in you, for you will inherit the earth. How enriched you are when you crave righteousness, for you will be satisfied. How blessed you are when you demonstrate tender mercy, for tender mercy will be demonstrated to you. What bliss you experience when your heart is pure, for then your eyes will open to see more and more of God. How joyful you are 
when you make peace, for then you will be recognized as a true child of God. How enriched you are when you are persecuted for doing what is right, for then you experience the realm of the heavenly kingdom. How blessed you are when people insult you and persecute you and perse sorry, persecute you and speak all kinds of cruel lies about you because of your love for me. So leap for joy, since your heavenly reward is great, for you are being rejected the same way the prophets were before you. This is the reading of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Dennis. So if peace or shalom is a right relationship with God, if it is a um, right relationship with ourselves, and if it's a right relationship with others, and if it's not just the absence of conflict, because anybody can do that, right? We, we're all good at avoiding conflict. That's easy. But if peace is something more than that, if it's this multi-dimensional uh, peace physically, psychologically, socially, spiritually, if it's a multi-dimensional peace, shalom as we described it, then we can agree that peacemaking is hard work. And if peacemaking is hard work, I think we can agree that we need a good foundation uh, if we're going to be people of peace, if we're going to be peacemakers. Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount talking about the importance of a good foundation. He says uh, in his last words of the Sermon on the Mount that um, a good foundation is listening and putting into practice my words. Uh, this is the, the part of the passage where he describes a solid foundation as the person who builds a house on the rock and a poor foundation as the person who builds their house on the sand, which I think would be a great kid's song. In two weeks, when we wrap up this series, if you could take a note of that, please, Elaine and Bev, or Bev, because um, I'll forget, so I'll just need you to take a note of that. Um, I think we can, Jesus is, uh, we can understand that a firm foundation is essential to be people of peace to be peacemakers and so what we can what I want to suggest is that peacemaking a foundation to peacemaking is the opposite of the Pax Romana the Pax Romana is the peace of Rome the enforced peace of Rome by the occupying nation in the in the nation of Israel to them peace is domination and violence and to Jesus Peace comes through servanthood and love. So let's talk about these things this morning. I want to talk about these things being the foundation of peacemaking, and then I want to talk a little bit about what it takes for us to be peacemakers, some practical ways that we can be understand entering into the work of peacemaking. But to start with this idea of servanthood, servanthood as being a foundation to peacemaking. Jesus establishes this when he, when he gives his instruction in Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28. And I'll just read these verses. They'll be up on the screen as well. This is a situation where, um, where the disciples are arguing about who will be greatest among them. And Jesus responds to his disciples and he says, You know that those who rule over the Gentiles show off their authority over, over them. He's saying, you know that they, they're going to practice domination. You know that they practice domination. And their high-ranking high officials order them around. But that's not the way it will be with you. Whoever wants to be great among you will be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you will be your, sa your slave. In other words, Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, it's going to be different. In my kingdom... It's not going to be like this Roman earthly kingdom that you're experiencing. We have a different ethic. We play by different rules. And for Jesus, servanthood is central to what it means to live in his kingdom. And it opens the door for peace. And I believe this is demonstrated in two ways. And in one case, I think we'll be quite familiar with. And maybe the second, a little bit less familiar with. But the first case is we certainly see that peacemaking... Or, or sorry, that servanthood as the foundation of peace comes when the person who has status or authority humbles themselves and assumes the role of a servant. This is what Jesus does. Jesus demonstrates that famously and beautifully at the Passover feast the night before he was to be crucified when he, as the Messiah, as the rabbi, as the teacher, 
puts the robe around his waist, and washes the feet of his disciples. He assumes the role of a servant among his disciples, and he shows to us that the way of peace is through serving one another. Another way that we see this happen is in a different situation. Imagine the person who has authority or rule refuses to humble themselves, refuses to take the role of a servant. Jesus talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount. You, you'll know the, the, the series in Matthew 5 called the Antitheses. There's these six antitheses. Um, you have, Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. The fifth antithesis is, you have heard it said, um, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say do not return violence with violence. And then Jesus goes on to give three real-life scenarios that his audience would understand and may have even experienced. And the third of that experience, or that, the third scenario, is this one where Jesus says, um, if they force you to walk a mile, then walk two miles. And in that situation, what Jesus is referring to is a practice where a Roman soldier, by the law, was given permission to take aside someone who was under their authority, a peasant Jew, for example. And remember, Jesus is speaking in the Sermon on the Mount to peasant Jews. That's largely his audience at that time. So they would have experienced this. The Roman soldier by law had the right to take that person aside, give them their backpack, their 70, 80-pound backpack, and force them to carry it for a mile. And Jesus says, don't just carry it one mile, but carry it two. Because in doing so, Jesus understood that it's a turning of the tables, that it's taking power away from the person who has the authority and putting it in the hands of the person who is oppressed. Because what would happen is, while it was illegal, while it was legal to force someone to carry a pack one mile, it was illegal to make them carry it two miles. So if that person continues to carry that pack, it creates a situation where you can imagine the soldiers like, no, no, stop, stop, come back, come back, I, I want my pack back. And it's a lifting up, James 4, 8 says that God opposes the proud and exalts the humble. And this is a scenario where the humble are being exalted and the proud are being brought low. This is the same sort of thing. It's a nonviolent way of dealing with conflict. It it's reminds us of Viola Desmond in Nova Scotia in New Glasgow when she refused to give up her seat in the white-only section of the movie theater. It reminds us of this... Uh, the scenario that I read about recently of nurses in Saskatchewan who were, and this might have been decades ago, I, I, where um, doctors, largely male doctors, largely female nurses, the doctors were abusing and browbeating and disregarding their nurses. And so with, an, with, a, uh, um, uh, with the permission of a, um, an administration, a sympathetic administration, they instituted what was called Code Pink, so when a nurse was being browbeaten by a doctor, cold pink would be called, and the nurses would come around and hold hands and form a circle around that doctor. And you can imagine what would happen, right? It was this awkward situation, but it dealt with the conflict in this nonviolent fashion. But it was a way of understanding that by um, the, the person who was supposed to be serving the other was being oppressed would be exalted. Servanthood is the first foundation of peacemaking in these various ways. The second is love. Love, not violence. Famili the, the, um, the people, again, that Jesus was speaking to would have been familiar with the violence of Rome. They would have been familiar even with two particular incidents that have been recorded in history. One where 2,000 insurrectionists were crucified. The Romans used crucifixion as not just a physical, uh, as, as a physical form of violence, but psychological violence. It was, they would leave the bodies up for days and days as a reminder of their force, as a reminder that you, if you cross us, the cross is going to be what happens to you. They would also be familiar with another historical incident where in a small village not too far from Nazareth, the, the, the whole town was taken into slavery because they were a group of people who had, in, who had sort of hidden and sheltered some insurrectionists. So they would understand that the Romans were violent. They would understand what violence was like. Violence is the Roman way, but love dismantles violence. 
In 2004, the rock band U2 came out with an album called How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb. And somebody asked Bono, how do you dismantle an atomic bomb? And Bono says, with love. That's how you dismantle an atomic bomb. It's through love. And in Matthew 22, Jesus establishes the law of love when answering the Pharisees' question, what is the greatest commandment? Again, a passage you might be familiar with and where the Pharisees have come to Jesus, they're seeking to trap him with this question. And they approach him and they say, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replies, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your being and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as yourself. Some call this the Jesus Creed. And in these two commandments, we find these three dimensions. Love of God, love of neighbor, and the assumed love of self. If Jesus says, you must love your neighbor as yourself, it's assumed that we love ourselves in a healthy way. So we find these three dimensions of love, love of God. God's initiating love, as we spoke about a few weeks ago. God's initiating love uh, brings peace into the world. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still enemies towards him, living apart from him, God initiates love as a, as a way of peace through God. So if we are to be peacemakers, we need to be fully alive in God's love for us. If we are to be peacemakers, we need to fully appreciate and love God's love for us. We need to be aware of it and soak it in and bathe in God's love for us if we are to be people of peace because it is God's love that will move us out into the world as we fully understand the depth of his love for us. The second dimension is this love of neighbor. I was fortunate for the last 10 years to be working alongside a woman uh, who understood what it meant to be a neighbor, who understood what it meant to express love to her neighbor. This is a public story that she has shared in the media many times. It's an, an astounding story of someone who um, had come out of a broken marriage, had spent some time healing from that broken marriage in a, in a women's, Christian women's shelter, and then moved into a neighborhood, a high-density, low-income neighborhood. And God, by his wisdom, placed her in the center of this neighborhood where she was looking out on the center block where all the kids were playing and where moms were walking their kids to school. And she recognized that this was a neighborhood that had some conflict. It was a neighborhood where there was a lack of peace. And so what did she do? She planted a garden out her front door and her kitchen being at the front door extended her kitchen and invited people in for tea. She started to make peace in her neighborhood. She invited kids to dig up carrots. She invited moms in for tea. She started to be a peacemaker in a neighborhood where there was conflict. And then love of self. As I mentioned earlier, maybe this isn't something that we talk about much. It feels kind of awkward. But unless we love ourselves, unless we come to terms with who we are, are at peace with ourselves, it's really impossible for us to love our neighbor. This isn't meant to be a self-absorbed love. It's meant to be a healthy love of ourselves, understanding who we are and who God has created us to be. If we're not at peace with ourselves, rather than rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep, we will be envious and selfish of those who are rejoicing. We will wish their circumstances were our circumstances Rather than being able to come alongside those who mourn, we will, be, we will have the inability to show compassion because we're too wrapped up in our own stuff. A healthy love of self recognizes who we are before God and is thankful for that and is okay with that and is appreciative of who God has made us to be. So peacemaking requires as its foundation being fully alive in the love of God in order that we may love ourselves and be freed up to love our neighbor, one another, and those around us. And of course, we're saying neighbor in a way of any of those who are in our sphere. It includes us as a community. 
It includes our physical neighbors. It includes those we work with. Whoever God has put into our lives, these are the people who we are to love as our neighbors. So I want to spend some time talking about what is it about peacemaking? How do we do peacemaking? Is servanthood and love are the foundations of peacemaking? How do we practice this? How do we actively enter into conflict with the goal of reconciliation and shalom? I'll suggest three things. The first is developing empathy and compassion. Empathy is a word that you probably hear a lot. Perhaps in your workplace, you're being taught to uh, practice empathy in a, uh, in, a, in a work environment. It's also a, a, a practice that I would say is a very biblical term. It's related very closely to the idea of compassion. And we've spoken about mercy and compassion over our time going through the Beatitudes. When you're in conflict with someone, uh, to practice empathy or compassion when you are in conflict with someone, try to first of all understand their viewpoint and understand their experiences. Ask yourself, why are they acting this way? What can I, by understanding them, I can understand possibly why are they acting this way? And then ask yourself, or then try to feel what they are feeling. Empathy, compassion has a lot about um, entering, imagining yourself feeling and trying to feel what they are feeling and trying to feel their experiences. Asking yourself, how does it feel to be in their shoes? Using your imagination to consider what it's like to be them. Allowing yourself to enter into their world. The second idea here is to place yourself in the company of others, including those, maybe first and foremost, those who you might find yourself in conflict with. We might say that Jesus' ministry was a, was a ministry of company. He moved into our neighborhood, as uh, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of John chapter 1 says, he incarnated himself and he moved into our neighborhood. And he remembered that while we were yet sinners, God took up residence with us. God took up residence amongst his humanity. Understandably, of course, sometimes we want to keep our distance from people who we are in conflict with. That's, we can't be peacemakers if we are keeping our distance, though, can we? We can't be good neighbors if we are keeping our distance from one another. So placing ourselves intentionally in the company of others creates the opportunity for dialogue, which is something we'll talk about in just a moment, but simply being in the presence of one another creates the opportunity for reconciliation and for peacemaking to take place. Now, of course, if it's dangerous to be in the company of somebody, that's not the command. Unless God has given you some special call to move into dangerous situations, to be a peacemaker, you know, where your physical safety is at, is at risk, that's a different thing. I used to, uh, you know, for the past number of years, run in a, uh, a street front, storefront ministry center. We used to train our staff and our volunteers that uh, because we would welcome people in who were often living with conflict, the risk of conflict erupting in that space was pretty high. And so the instruction was, if something happens, if a person who is in conflict is suddenly becoming a threat to us and becoming violent, what do we do? We leave. <laughs> we evacuate the space. We keep everybody, our self space. We keep our, our, our guests and our clients safe. And even the person who stays behind to try and mediate that conflict makes sure that they're always in between that person and the door. Right? We don't need to enter into these you know, put our lives at risk in this sense, unless, again, that's some special calling that God has on our lives. And lastly, we place ourselves, uh, when we place ourselves in the company of others uh, who we're in conflict with, we create opportunities for dialogue. Dialogue, however, isn't always possible. You may come across situations where uh, the person who you're in conflict with doesn't want to talk about it. They're not ready to talk about it. Or it's just physically not possible. And so I want to suggest as a first step in creating dialogue when you come across that sort of situation is the skill or the, the, um, the practice of writing a letter. There's a New Testament um, uh, a biblical scholar out of the States named Gary Berg who does a lot of work around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 
And in one of his books, he talks about this organization that brings together uh, mothers, well, parents of um, fallen Israeli soldiers and parents of those who have died, Palest par Palestinian parents of those who have died in the conflict. And they bring them together to create an opportunity for reconciliation, of course, with willing partners, and, and when there's willingness to do that. And often it begins with letter writing, one taking the initiative and writing a letter to the other, one mom writing a letter to the other. So in this one situation, I'm going to read to you a letter that was written by the mother of an Israeli soldier who was killed at a, at a checkpoint by a Palestinian sniper. That sniper, four years later, was arrested. And this mother of the fallen Israeli soldier writes this letter to the other mother. She says, after your son was captured, I spent many sleepless nights thinking about what to do. Should I ignore the whole thing? Or will I be true to my integrity and to the work that I am doing and try to find a way for closure and reconciliation? This is not easy for anyone, and I am just an ordinary person, not a saint. I have now come to the conclusion that I would like to try to find a way to reconcile. You can go to the next slide. Maybe this is difficult for you to understand or believe, but I know that in my heart it is the only path that I can choose. For if what I say is what I mean, it is the only way. This letter writing, this letter from one mother to another, opened the door for dialogue and opened the door for reconciliation between an Israeli and a Palestinian, where once there had been conflict between them. You might find yourself in a similar situation where there's someone that you just can't reach, and a letter might be that first good step. We don't, of course, control what happens afterwards. We don't know if the letter gets read, if it gets returned, if it gets thrown into the fire, or if, in fact, it may open the door for dialogue and for peace and reconciliation. The beatitude that we're looking at this morning ends with the word, with the words, for they will be called children of God. A child resembles their parent, don't they? Genetically, we look like our parents. And as peacemakers, when we are doing the work of making peace in conflict, we look like our father. We look like our father who initiated peace with us by sending us his son, the Lord Jesus. And as we've spoken about, as we've sung about, as we've prayed about this morning, if this is new to you, if this is something you have not reflected on before, as we go through, as we take communion together, I invite you to reflect on the love of God for you, the, initi the initiative that God has taken to create peace with you in this broken relationship, which is a reality because of our brokenness and our sinfulness. I, take, I invite you to reflect on that, and I'd love to hear from you if you're doing some thinking and wondering about that. So I'm going to invite John to come forward, and we're going to have our communion thought and take communion together this morning.